Now, I'm really glad to, in to introduce Jeff Lawson, CEO and co-founder of Twilio and author of the book, Ask Your Developer. So if we can uh, have uh, Jeff with us. Hello, Jeff. How are you? Hello, Mehdi. How are you? I'm doing really great. As I said, it's, it's an honor to have you. As I said, Jeff Lawson and the Twilio name has been quoted so many times by API speakers. <laughs> so now, before not, not only the name, uh, the, the speaker directly. So uh, yeah, we're really glad to have you here. Um, so for the few for the few folks who've slept the last ten years in the API industry, right? Can you tell a little bit about what is Twilio today, and like uh, yeah, what is Twilio today, and share with us some numbers about what what has been accomplished so far? Absolutely, Twilio is the customer infrastructure that allows companies and developers to really engage with their customers using every medium of communications that there is on the planet, voice, text, video, email, you name it, as well as the infrastructure to understand your customers. So to be able to take all the data that you know about your customers and uh, via our product segment that we acquired last year, be able to actually build a profile of your customer. So when you think about it, understanding your customer and then communicating with them, that's the core of how you build an engaging customer experience. And Twilio is the API infrastructure that allows every company to do that at scale, globally, and uh, as well as the most amazing digital companies out there. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's, I think it's a great, uh, uh, it's really a great uh, explanation. And I just want to uh, also to ask you, uh, you start the book, uh, you start the book, ask your developer. So let me let me get my copy. Let me get my copy because actually I I, I devoured it, right? <laughs> I think I read it two times to be sure I understood everything. Uh, but you start the book with the story of the the, the famous ask your developer storyboard, um, uh, you know, like billboard, sorry. Yeah. Uh, you know, like in the San Francisco, I was in the Bay Area at the time. Why well, I say, who, had, who is this company who is able to pay so much just for red billboard, just with the ask your developer. So can you tell a little bit the story behind this? Absolutely, right. So we, it was several years ago. Um, we went public in 2016. It was a couple of years before IPO and we were, sent, we were asking ourselves a question like, how do we raise the visibility of, of what Twilio is? Because, you know, we're a developer API. We're behind the scenes. And sure, developers know who we are, but, you know, nobody else seems to. How do we build awareness of, of Twilio? So we said, well, let's get a billboard. And it's pretty common in Silicon Valley uh, along the, the major expressway, the 101. Uh, for tech companies to buy billboards. It's good for recruiting. It's good for finding, you know, we all have a lot of customers in, in the Bay Area. And so it's good for building awareness of our brands. And so we said, let's get a, a billboard. And they said, okay, well, what should we put on the billboard? And I remember we hired this advertising firm to come in and advise us. And they interviewed customers and they interviewed employees. And they came back to us with just a bunch of absolutely horrible ideas for what the billboard should say. You know, it's like, like all your very vanilla things like, oh, such and such a company trusts Twilio with their communications. You're like, this is really boring. So we sat in a room, we said, what should we, uh, what should we have the billboard say? And, you know, something that had been in my head, you know, one of the things you kind of think about in the shower, you know, why you're not doing anything else was uh, here in the United States, I know we have a very global audience, but here in the United States, there's advertisements for medicines, like right? drugs. And they always, at the end of them, they say, you know, ask your, ask your doctor if, you know, you know, well, Felatrin is right for you. And it's always like, because you need to get prescribed by a doctor. So the call to action in these ads is always, ask your doctor if this is right for you. And I always had this idea in my head of like, you know, companies should really be asking their developers if Twilio is right for them because developers are the ones who know. Developers are the ones who are adopting Twilio. They're bringing it into companies. They're building amazing things with it. Yet the business executives, the product managers, the C-suite, they don't really know what Twilio is and we want them to know. And so I just kind of blurted it out in this meeting. I was like, what about, what if our billboard just says, ask your developer? And everyone says, what is that? What does that mean? I'm like, I'm not entirely sure, but I really think it means two things. You know, and this is why it's been floating around in my head for so long. First, it's a nod to the developers. You're in the know. You know all the new innovations that are coming out, especially in terms of infrastructure, APIs that allow you to have superpowers as a developer. 
but you get to, with a few lines of code, incorporate this amazing new technology, whether it's things that Amazon was building at AWS, whether it is Twilio with communications, Stripe with payments, right? There's all these great APIs. You now have superpowers developers and you get to go build these amazing things and just blow the socks off all the people that you work with because I saw all the time at, at Twilio in our customer base um, where, you know, a developer would be in a, in a meeting and, and you know, the, the leadership would be saying something like, you know, we, we really need to kick off a project to do A, B, and C. And, you know, we think it's going to be an 18 month project and we're going to have to go get a bunch of budget and all this kind of stuff. And the developers are sitting there saying like 18 months, like there's an API. I know an API, like I know how to do that. And they would literally show up the next day to the team meeting and say, Hey, you know, that idea we talked about yesterday that we said was going to take, you know, 18 months. I built it yesterday, yesterday afternoon. Let me show it to you. And developers are changing the nature of how to build, how to build iteratively, how to build quickly, how to iterate, listen to customers and constantly improve the products in a way that a lot of business people didn't know about yet. And so um, it was, first of all, a hat tip to developers. You're leading the charge here. The other thing it was, was a signal to the business side of, hey, you know, developers have a lot more to add to the business than just writing code. You know, at a lot of businesses, uh, executives and other business leaders, like just, they don't really know what developers do. We're, we're all kind of mysterious. Like, I don't know, we just sit at computers and put on headphones and we don't want to be bothered. And so they assume that we are like factory workers in the digital era where, if you give us specifications documents that tell us exactly what to build, then we can dutifully write some code that does what the spec does. And up the other side of this black box machine, you get code. And if that's the expectation that business people have of developers, then they're, then that's exactly what they'll get. But if, and that's, I, I call that telling developers, like giving developers a solution, go build this solution. But if instead you ask your developer what's possible. You think of them as creative problem solvers who are your partners in building a great digital business. Then you don't give developers solutions and say, go build this. Someone else, you know, who understands business and understands customers made all the decisions. We just need you to grind out some code. Instead, you go to those developers with the business problems you're trying to solve. And you ask your developer, you don't tell them, you ask them, hey, developers, how do you think we would go about solving this business problem or this customer problem? And when you go to developers with that question instead of the answer, you get a whole different type of engagement from those developers. Now, that was the, the, the very, like in three words, <laughs> how could we say all that much? Ask your developer. So it really took me um, actually sitting down and writing the book to flesh out that big idea that developers are partners in building in this digital economy. So instead of thinking of them as just, you know, digital factory workers, we're going to grind out code. Think of them as creative problem solvers to whom you take the hardest business problems you're trying to solve and see what creative solutions you're going to get. And, and that's the core hypothesis of the book, ask your developer and outline all the ways in which, which business people can better understand their software and their technical talent. Yeah, and it seems it was so hard. At least you've seen so many uh, examples that you had to write a book about it. <laughs> you know, it was the, the, the tension needs to be really, really high for you with your busy schedule to spend time to actually tell the story. What, what, do you have any example about how hard it has been in your career to, and for example, for people who didn't ask their developers, right? And people, you, you, you mentioned Tesla, who, for example, who think software compared to other companies, like why, why it was so important to make a book about it? Well, I see this all the time. You know, at Twilio, um, we have over 230,000 customers that represents everything from you know, startups to Fortune 100 companies and everything in between across every category you can imagine, every vertical you can imagine, financial services, healthcare, retail, real estate, you name. And one of the most common conversations that I'll have with business executives is they'll ask, they'll say, you know what, we, we really want to be as good at building digital products as, you know, Amazon and Facebook and Google and all this kind of stuff. But man, where do we start? 
How do we hire great developers? Once they're here, how do I get them to stay? They're getting job offers all the time from you know, those companies. How do I keep them here? And, and by the way, like, you know, and they sometimes are timid. They're like, I, I don't think we know how to build software at this company. You know, I, software is something that Google does. It's something that Facebook does. It's not something that our company does. We're a, you know, a, a financial services company. We're a retail company. How do we build software? And so I've had that conversation with executives so many times. I said, let me finally sit down. Let me, let me write the book. And let me give folks a roadmap, essentially, for how to become a great digital company. Because every company has to become a digital company if they want to survive. You know, uh, 20 years ago, people looked at Amazon as a retailer and they said, oh, like, you know, this is, is this e-commerce thing going to work? And, oh, they just sell books. Okay, we can ignore that. And pretty soon it became very obvious to everybody in retail that, oh no, Amazon's going to sell everything. And unless you figure out how to be as good at e-commerce as Amazon is, then they're just going to eat your lunch. And so that became obvious in retail pretty quickly. But then, especially with the mobile boom that went on, you know, in the, you know, starting in the you know, late 2000s, it became obvious that no industry was safe. Every industry was going to get challenged by some digital native startup who were going to look at the status quo of an industry and say, huh, I think we can improve on that customer experience and we can do it by primarily being a software company. So you look at there's digital only banks, there's digital real estate companies, there's obviously there's so many direct consumer retail businesses. There is, you know, my favorite example, and I'll, and I'll talk about banks for a second. Because it's such an obvious example where 20 years ago, your bank was a physical bricks and mortar location that you went to, right? I don't know how old you are. I still remember those days of going to the bank and, you know, you liked your bank if, you know, there was enough parking so you could park there. There was, you know, a fresh coat of paint that looked kind of nice and the teller was friendly, and if they gave your kid a lollipop and like, if they did those things, you're like, okay, I like my bank. It's pretty good because guess what? Every bank has basically the same products, checking account, savings account, mortgages, you name it. Right. And nowadays, what makes you like your bank? I haven't been to a bricks and mortar retail branch in like a decade. I like my bank. If the mobile app is fast and doesn't crash and has features that make my life easier. Like, you know, they have the, the face unlock on the iPhone. You're like, oh yeah, they added that. I like that. It, I don't set my password anymore. That's great. I like my bank. Right. And so you think about that. You like your bank if their software developers are on top of their game, building a great mobile app. That's what makes you love your bank. And in that world, every company therefore has to become a great digital software company. Otherwise, they will get disrupted by a startup or by one of the other incumbents. And I've seen it play out industry after industry. I've talked about banking, even automotive. We talked about with Tesla, right? What happens? The first thing is there's some startup who's really good at building software. You know, many of those companies are, are like Silicon Valley oriented companies and they think software first. And they hire a lot of great technical talent. They say, how can we go change this industry? And at first, you know, everyone looks at them, oh, what's that little stupid thing, right? And then they start getting traction. Why? Because the art of software is being able to listen to your customers and hearing a problem and then quickly building a prototype, putting that in front of a handful of customers and saying, are we on the right track? And when customers say, yeah, you're on the right track, you keep building. And they say, you're not, you go back to the drawing board and you build the next version. And you do this iteratively, sprint over sprint. And in the course of doing this with the tight feedback loops with customers involved at every step of the way, you quickly find the problems that the legacy industry has not solved because out of necessity, startups have to find problems, unsolved problems for customers if they're going to survive. And so evolution requires that those companies quickly figure out big problems. And when they do, they tend to get traction. So what happens? The incumbents who oftentimes were slower moving, not great at software, didn't have those tight feedback loops, they start to get, uh, you know, they start to actually lose customers because those startups are winning the hearts, minds, and wallets of, of, of the customer. 
And then one by one, those incumbents wake up and say, oh, wow, we've got to start doing that too. Because the executives say, how come my, how come my, you know, our app isn't as good as that one? Like I downloaded that startup one. So they're just so good. How come ours isn't good? And, and so they have to, and they have to hire software developers and they have to start getting agile and adopt sprints and do all this stuff. And one by one, every one of the companies in a particular industry has to adopt those software practices if they're going to survive. And it's literally this Darwinian evolution that goes on in every industry. And the interesting thing about software, software and the agility that software brings is like the key to evolution, right? Think about evolution. <laughs> the strongest survive. The, those that can adapt quickly survive. And that's what software lets you do. And I always think back to the old days, 20 years ago, and IT departments mostly were racking and stacking servers and you know, you would have some big piece of software you needed to run the business. And there was always this classic build versus buy decision. Classic decision. Everything, well, oh, build or buy, build or buy, right? And, you know, you'd say, well, we need this thing. We could build a financial system. But like the sales rep from Oracle comes in and says, no, 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 you'd be an idiot to go build your own financial system. You just buy ours, right? And actually, they were right, right? You, you shouldn't go build your own financial system. Customers don't care about it. You should just buy something from a vendor. And so in that build versus buy world, companies typically bought. But now that software is customer facing, customers do care about the mobile app or the website, what it does. How is it making my life better? Is it easy to use? Is it fast? In that world, you can't buy your way out of that. You have to build. And so what we're running into now is this Darwinian evolution of every industry where those who build are those who survive. And so it's no longer build versus buy, it's build versus die. And I've seen it happen in every single industry. And that's the trend, that's the trend of the last decade, and it's going to continue to be the trend of the next decade. Yeah, and actually uh, in the conferences, a lot, a lot of... Uh... We hear often, like, for example, yeah, security, it was too important 20 years ago to do it yourself. You have to go to a vendor. Now security is too important to do it through a vendor. You have to do it yourself. It seems it's the same for these important software. Now you have to invest in a software in your own organization. The offshore era has disappeared, right? You know, because in the book, you have this quote that I found completely uh, uh, outstanding, which is, you can't buy differentiation. You can't buy differentiation, so you have to build it. Because else the competition can buy what you can buy too, right? And if yeah, right. If you just buy some off-the-shelf experience, like if the bank just buys the mobile app from some vendor, then every bank will just buy that same thing and they'll be completely undifferentiated. So one of those banks is going to go, oh, we have to build something to differentiate. And that starts the process. You can't buy differentiation. You have to build it. And that's just one of the truisms of our time. But here's to bring it back to APIs, though, here's the interesting thing. You know, 20 years ago, if you had to build software, like you were kind of on your own, you were building everything yourself, probably in C, right? And it was, that was hard. And back in those days, you would say, okay, yeah, I, the software companies of the world, they're called Oracle and, and Microsoft. And like, there's a very small number of them who really know how to do software well. But now you've got amazing infrastructure behind every software developer and every app, right? And if you look at, you know, Amazon Web Services, Twilio, Stripe, you know, all the whole category of APIs that are now baked into every app that we use. This is the evolution of the digital supply chain. And every mature industry, when you think about it, has a supply chain, right? I, like I grew up in Detroit. And Detroit is the automotive capital of the United States. I think we like to think of the automotive capital of the world. I don't know if the world agrees with us on that, but... Um, you know, there it was very obvious what the supply chain did. You had the steel companies that made steel. You had the companies that made seatbelts. You had companies that made the steering wheels. You had like every part inside of a car was made by some vendor. And it was that specialization um, that got innovation, that got cost down, all that kind of stuff. So you have a mature supply chain in an industry like the automotive industry. Yet the software industry 20 years ago, there was no such thing. You know, you were building everything from scratch. But now APIs represent the supply chain of the digital economy. It's the digital supply chain that allows every company to be great builders of software because they don't have to build it all themselves. And the way I think about it, 
Every company out there, you need to be builders of software if you're going to compete and win. True. But you don't have to build it all yourself. You buy the things that enable you to build. And that's that supply chain. And that's how companies can actually become great software companies without having to hire, you know, the low level C programmers who, you know, are, are really hard to hire great ones. You know, you can take a wide variety of people and make them into great developers because they have world-class infrastructure behind them. Yeah. And, and it seems like in this digital supply chain, like this digital factory, everybody is consuming an API of someone else at the end, right? So the goal is to uh, like provide your some core competencies to other via API, but integrating some core competencies of others directly via their API, right? In a global, let's say, digital supply chain. But then how to make the decision, the right decision? So uh, because you started the company, I think, Twilio in 2008, the real start. Um, and why did you have in the mind to say, look, we need to build product as APIs or APIs product? What, what was your vision at the time? Because there were really, really few companies who had this strategy at the time. Well. You know, I was a software developer and I had started three companies before Twilio. And there were com three completely different companies. One was an academic content company for college students. Uh, another company was a, a bricks and mortar retailer. Another company was doing a live event ticket um, uh, uh, exchange so people could buy and sell tickets from each other. And despite the fact these businesses were completely different, they had two things in common. First was we were using software. You know, we were using software to iterate and out-innovate our competition um, using all the dynamics I said before. The second thing was that every one of those companies, we needed to engage with our customers. We needed to, to build that relationship and that meant communications. And it was very different parts of the customer life cycle at the different companies. You know, sometimes it was when we were selling to the customers. Sometimes it was when we were marketing to them. Sometimes it was when we were trying to fulfill on a product or, you know, logistics of like shipping a product to the customer and things like that. Other times it was when they needed service and support. But every company, we had these moments where we said, oh, wouldn't it be a great customer experience if we could enable a customer to reach out to us or us to reach out to the customer in some way that was automatic, tied to the code, tied to our databases. It was like a part of an application flow. So, oh yeah, that'd be amazing. Except I'm a software developer. I don't know the first thing about how to make a phone ring, right? Like that's just magical. Like some voltage appears on some phone line somewhere in the world and the phone ring, like, I don't know how that works, right? So you turn to the companies, you know, that seemed like they knew how this worked. We turned to the telecommunications companies, the telcos. We turned to Cisco, people like that. We'd say, hey, you know, we have this idea. How do we make it work? And we got the same answer back every time. It was like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's, well, that's a neat idea. We think we can help you with that. Okay, the first step is, uh, you know, you're going to you know, pull a bunch of wires from the carrier to your data center, like copper wires. Need, holes need to be dug in the ground to run wires. Step, step two is you're going to rack up a bunch of telco hardware. Step three is you got to buy a bunch of software. And then, you know, we think we can get it to do what you want it to do, but we're going to have to hire this like army of, of telco consultants to come in and, and integrate it all together. And we can make it work, but it's going to cost, you know, $3 million and it's going to take, you know, two, three years to go build. But sign here, we'll get started. And every time I was like, wait a minute, hold on a second. First of all, millions of dollars for this like one feature that we have in mind. I don't have that kind of money, but let's say I did, right? You know, it's more offensive than the millions of dollars was like the years that they were quoting that it would take to build this thing. Like, what is this? Is this, you know, 1990? Are we doing waterfall development still? I'm accustomed to, to weeks, you know, where we iterate week over week and we build customer value constantly. And when we get that feedback, we're able to incorporate it right in. And this world of telco would be like, oh, you build version one. No customer has eyeballs on it until it's done multiple years from now. Then they use it. Then they tell us what we should have built. And then you're, it, you know, you're in another multi-million dollar, multi-year project to go build version two. And you're like, this is not how software works. And so when we thought about it, you know, we said, oh, we could go build an, an app or something. But, you know, the things that we had needed at all my prior companies was not an app. It was like a component of the experience we were building. We said, this isn't about some new app. It's not about some PBX or something like that, which is like the, the company phone system. This is about making communications 
just a fundamental part of the software toolkit. So that every developer who runs into the same problems that I ran into at company after company of, oh, we need, we need to reach out to our customer when this happens. We need to let them reach out to us when that happens. They say, ah, I know how to solve that. It's an API call away. And they can integrate Twilio in five minutes, solve that problem. And so that's what we said. We said communications, just like storage and compute and payments, needs to be a fundamental uh, piece of infrastructure that every developer has in their toolkit. And that's why we started the company as a, a platform infrastructure company, not as an app company. And this was, you're right, this was very counterintuitive at the time. In fact, I remember going to raise money in 2008 uh, when we, you know, we built our, our, we talked to a lot of customers when we started the company, developers, and, and we got a sense that, oh yeah, this is going to be needed. And so we went and built the prototype. We built the prototype and put it in front of those developers. And they started building amazing things. And so that was encouragement for us. And so we kept building. And I went out in the summer of 2008 to go raise money, a uh, seed round, to get Twilio off the ground. And two things happened when I went to go raise that round. First of all, summer of 2008, financial, global financial meltdown in full swing. You know, no investors, they weren't even investing at all. They were just like, you know what? We don't even know what's going on anymore. We're, we're not investing right now. Uh, but... But ones that were, that wasn't true. Not every investor was doing it. Some investors were investing. But for those, they, they looked at what I was planning and they said, well, I don't understand this. Developers aren't a market. Developers aren't, you know, they don't have the pocketbook. They don't sign checks at companies, right? How, how are you going to make money? And, you know, every one of those investors, I remember saying a pretty similar thing. They said, you know, why don't you go build an app? Everyone, you know, companies buy apps. Go build an app. And software as a service was, you know, the big thing, right? Go build a SaaS application. And if you're successful, one day you can add an API to it. That made total sense, right? That's what Facebook did. It's working out well for them, right? And so um, that was the advice that we got. And I remember we went that whole summer without, we didn't raise a single dollar of investor money. We didn't even have a bank account because we had nothing to put in the bank account. Um, and so I had this moment where, uh, you know, myself, my co-founders, we, we, we kind of looked at each other and we said, oh, is, is this stupid, right? Every investor, these are smart people. You know, they've built a lot of businesses in the past. They're telling us we're wrong. Maybe we should just build an app. I don't know. But we looked at each other and we said, hold on a second. Our customers are telling us we're right. Our customers, those developers are talking, are telling us we're on the right track. And our gut, and, if, and, and, and I had come from Amazon. I was one of the first product managers at AWS before starting Twilio. And so I saw this notion of oh, infrastructure delivered as APIs and seeing how powerful that idea can be. I said, you know what? I think that in the coming years, developers, because of this idea that I can pull infrastructure off the shelf and for pennies start building that's going to mean that the cost of innovation is going to come down, the barriers to it, everything that is like, oh, when things cost millions of dollars, great, there's all these approvals and all the slow things, but when it costs a penny, you don't need any of that. You just start building. And that's going to further encourage developers to be at the forefront of what's possible because they don't have to run and get approvals and get budget. They can just put it on a credit card and start building. And then when that thing works and you've proved it out for you know $10, then, you know, you can, you can basically start scaling it up and very cost effectively. And so that reduction of risk will, be, uh, will cause an increase in innovation. And that will put developers in the driver's seat of, how to, of who can innovate, who makes decisions, who decides what vendors we're going to use. Because it's no longer a big, let's do an RFP and take six months to pick a vendor. Developers are just going to pick it in, in minutes and they're going to build. And the thing they build is that prototype's going to turn into the, the, the production thing. So developers are not yet, but they're going to become really influential in the buying cycles of every company. And we've listened to our customers, those developers who are building amazing things and telling us we're on the right track. So we said, you know what? Let's ignore those investors. Let's follow our customers. And we did. And then we launched Twilio publicly and immediately got people starting to pay us and we started making money. And then we circle back with those investors and, you know, 
with the proof of developers were actually buying and building and launching and our revenue starting to grow, those investors, uh, many of them uh, could actually see the opportunity. And we did end up raising our seed round and multiple rounds more. Yeah. Is the story true that uh, I think Fred Wilson says about, you know, that you came say, we've gathered the whole telco industry into five API calls. Let mm -hmm. me show you my computer. That That is the true story. Yeah. Yeah. And I did a demo uh, of Twilio in many of those investor meetings uh, because it was hard to explain APIs. What can you do? I'll say, I said, you know what? Uh, my, my, my favorite demo was always, um, you know, and, you know, this is before Zoom, right? Conference calling was like people getting conference calls all the time. And I said, you know, I bet I can build a conference call application using Twilio faster than you could schedule a conference call with your assistant. <laughs> and <laughs> I'd offer them the challenge. And they usually declined to actually ask their assistant to schedule a call. But um, I would write in front of their eyes with five lines of code, give or take, build a conference call application. And I'd provision a phone number in their area code, often with their name in the phone number, mm -hmm. real time, wired up to the app I just built and I said, okay, go ahead, give it a call. And you know that just showed the power of what was possible. People are used to being, oh, you need conference call? Okay, we gotta go to <laughs> AT&T or British Telecom or one of these big companies and say, okay, we gotta, we gotta go do a whole buying cycle. It's gonna cost you know a lot of money and six months from now all the solutions stood up. And I'm like, I just built it in two minutes. So if I can build a conference calling application in two minutes, what do you think the developers of the world can build if they have this power too? And that's yeah, what and we're uh, starting. Yeah. And I, I will say to all people listening, you can uh, we will have a specific uh, moment where we will ask questions directly from the audience. So don't hesitate in the chat, whatever on the LinkedIn live stream or Twitter live stream or directly on Hopin, you can ask directly questions. Uh, I will select the, the top ones and, and ask them directly to, to Jeff. So this is a... A moment when you can ask your own question, like so. Ask your developer, ask your uh, community members, right? So, so uh, Jeff, like, okay, you you have this ask your developer mindset. So, because you know, developers will be the one implementing it, so they are the one knowing actually hands on that. Yeah, this one, this way, this path is really risky, really poor documentation, really poor software. This one is great, easy to integrate and easy to use. So it's safer to go to that path to that from the other path, but then how it has evolved over the last 10 years, how the developer was just like, you know, someone maybe with a voice not heard today in Silicon Valley, for example, how much developers are heard uh, in, in uh, you know, by, by product managers or, or, or business? Well, you know, it's not something where it's just like, oh, you know, it's, it's obvious, you know, we should ask developers, right? Because um, people have their roles. In fact, I would say a lot of developers actually do themselves a disservice because they kind of don't want to be bothered with like, hey, and they kind of give this, just give me a specification. If the spec's not like fully articulated, they'll kind of get, you know, irritated. Like, hey, you know, you didn't say this and send it back over the wall. You're like, that's not healthy. And, and so I think the way that it tends to happen is when you get developers who are creative and a lot of developers, not everybody, you know, you, know, you can't say the one thing about every single human being who does a job, but a lot of developers that I know are incredibly creative. And you think about it. What is writing code? It's creative problem solving. That's what writing code is. And so creative problem solving doesn't end at like, how do I, you know, turn a spec into code? Creative problem solving can be applied to a lot of domains. And so what happens is when developers start piping up with like, hey, have we thought about this? Have we thought about that? And then in particular, when they show what's possible, and they say, you know, because you can sit in meetings and like debate things endlessly. But when you actually say, you know, what, let me go whip up a prototype and we can put our hands in it. We can feel it. We can touch it. We can put it in front of customers and get feedback. That's where developers really start building their credibility as people who can move these conversations forward and, and turn, in, uh, turn ideas into creative solutions. And the more developers are able to do that, the more they're able to show the power of like, hey, we shouldn't just be sitting here having a conversation. We should be uh, actually trying things. And we should be able to learn quickly from customers. And by the way, when a developer can build something quickly and show it off to business people and executives, everyone gets really excited, right? Nobody says, hey, I, I you know, why, why did you build that in two hours? You know, why did you waste two hours and 15 cents of our company's money to try out an idea, like nobody gets mad at that. They're amazed. They say, oh, that's amazing. Oh my God, look at that. We were just talking about it yesterday and here we are, there's a prototype sitting in front of me. 
And usually they start engaging. Oh, oh, can it do this? Can it do that? What about this? Oh, I've got so many ideas now. People get really excited. That's the power developers have to show what not only what's possible with the technology, but what their potential is. And when I see that happen, I see developers being asked new questions and being you know, come to them. And I found this myself uh, in my career. And, the, and I have this notion of like, ask your developer often, it kind of goes back to an experience that I had earlier in my career. So I started um, my second company with uh, someone, uh, his name's Matt. He was my co-founder. And this was the retail business, a bricks and mortar retail business. And Matt was a total technophobe. Meaning, <laughs> He, he like didn't know, well, I first hired him at my first company. That's how I met him. And I, he showed up his first day and I gave him a laptop and he was supposed to manage 15,000 people. That was his job. And I was like, here's your laptop. He's like, oh, I don't need that. I'm like, what do you mean you don't need it? He was 1999. I'm like, what do you mean you don't need a laptop? He's like, I don't, know. I don't use those things. So he's a technophobe, right? And I'm like, okay, that's sort of weird. And in our second company, uh, he was the CEO and I was the CTO. So I was writing all this technology. He was running the business. And we got into this great dynamic where he would come to me and say, hey, you know, Jeff, I'm trying to solve this problem. This was a bricks and mortar retailer. He'd say things like, you know, I'm trying to figure out how do I, how do I incentivize the salespeople inside the store to uh, serve customers and like convert people who walk in the door into people who buy things. And He's like, I'm trying to solve this problem. Can you help me solve that? I was like, oh, that's interesting. Oh, you know, and I was thinking about it. I'm like, you know, those like people counters that are at the door of stores where they have a, a light beam and you walk through it, it increments a counter. I was like, well, what if we got one of those? And I bet there's some of those that have APIs. I could extract the data of how many people walk through the door that day. And then I could go into the point of sale system and say, how many unique people bought something today? by hour, by minute either, right? And then correlate those things together and show the manager of the stores and the salespeople how quickly they're converting people who walk in the door to, into buyers. And I was like, let me work on that. And like a week later, I got my hands on one of those people counters and I built up a prototype and I showed it to him. I was like, oh, wow, that's, oh, that's amazing. And he's like, yeah, let me put it in front of the salespeople. And then sure enough, it worked. And so I got that notion from my experience with Matt, who's a total technophobe. So he didn't know to come to me and say, Jeff, we need a people counter. And then I need you to correlate it back to the point of sale data and put the number right here. He didn't know how to say, this is what I want. What he knew how to do though, is to ask the right questions. And that's where I got into this idea of like, wait, this ask your developer mindset where you've got a business person, they're not supposed to know the answers. You don't have to pretend like they know the answers. All they have to really know how to do is ask the right questions of a technical counterpart. And that's really magical. Yeah, we have a question from the audience about API, API failures. So when you are a piece of infrastructure, when you are as a service piece of code, right, provided by an API, how important is to be reliable so to have the trust of your customers? You know, we say at Twilio, trust is the number one thing we sell. Because think about anything that happens in the cloud, whether it's an application with software as a service, or whether it's APIs as infrastructure, the core value proposition that you're making to your customer is this, saying, hey, customer, trust me to execute on this part of your company better than you can do it yourself. And that's why you're going to essentially you know, hand this part of your company, this, one, this workload that you need solved, you're going to hand it to me because you trust that I, who am specializing in this thing, who am operating at cloud scale and doing all these things, hiring all this talent who's only focused on this one problem, trust that I am going to execute on this better than you can even do it yourself. That's the core value proposition of the entire cloud, software as a service, APIs, everything. And then APIs are even more important because people build on top of you. So when you fail, then there's failures of, of, of your customers and they don't know why. And so they're hunting around, what's going wrong? What's going wrong? And then, you know, they find out why. So APIs are even more important. But it all goes back to trust. Trust is the number one thing that you sell. And it's sort of interesting because I've, I've often been asked questions about like, well, what happens when these big cloud providers have failures? And certainly it can happen. It's technology. Technology has failures. That is certainly the case. But what I often ask them is, you know, first of all, you know, you can have failures yourself. Who do you think is more likely to have catastrophic failures, like major cloud providers or, you know, you running your own data center? And empirically, they always look at their history and they say, hmm, 
Yeah, I think I think you know we're you know, the company themselves are more likely to have a catastrophic failure than trusting a cloud provider where you're amassing a lot of knowledge and skill and expertise in that domain and where the stakes are higher because you're serving many 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 customers, not just one. And then the second thing I point to also empirically is you know you remember the internet of 2002 2003 like there were websites, big, well-known websites who would still have, a, oh, we're down for maintenance for 10 hours on a weekly basis, you know, or they had major outages because they couldn't consume the spikes of traffic and things like that. Things were really fragile. And so when you compare that world to what we have today now with the cloud infrastructure we have, the internet is much more scalable, much more stable. Websites and mobile apps, like they just tend to work. In fact, when they don't work, it's a big notable event. You know, there was a CBN company who I won't, I won't name, I won't embarrass them, but they had an outage a few weeks ago, if you remember that. And it was like a big news. The CNN is talking about, oh my God, there's a bunch of websites that are offline. Like that's how rare it is when there's major outages. Whereas, it, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it was happening all the time. It wasn't even news where it was like, oh yeah, of course, the websites are down, whatever. I remember um, even uh, websites that were open only eight to five because the it was 1995, 1996, but because the, the builder of the website has to shut down the, the computer. But yeah, no, yeah, they closed the laptop. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, reliability is important. So we have three minutes. I will take one question from the from the audience uh, about like how developers are now key stakeholders. It was ask your developers. Some companies are still not there yet, but when we will have the time where developers will be actually the one deciding completely, not just prescribing, but deciding completely about the, uh, the, the decision, the tech decision. There's a lot of companies where that is the case, by the way. And even when you look at executives and you look at uh, people who were developers who are becoming, um, who that technology expertise and that experience is getting more and more valuable. And so those people are actually becoming the C-suite now in many companies, like look at, you know, a lot of the executives that you actually see that actually uh, started their career as developers. Um, and, you know, look at like Andy Jassy is now the CEO of Amazon. He wasn't a developer, but he built AWS. You, know, you look at, you know, Satya Nadella and, um, you, you know, and even in startups, right? Like Toby from Shopify developer, I'm a developer, right? So you're starting to see developers take that skill set and turn it into an executive skill set as well. But other thing you see is developers are being trusted with a lot of decisions, right? And I advocate quite a bit, like you should ask your developers, you know, not just what you should build, but also how you should build. Because if you want to compete in this economy, right, you need to be agile. So what's going to allow you to do that? Well, adopting a lot of this cloud infrastructure. And developers know what's at stake, right? They know that, oh, if we don't have this great infrastructure, then we won't be able to build. And they will... A, vote with their feet. They'll go to a company that does let them uh, build things in this modern way. Um, but they'll also vote with uh, their wisdom when you consult them. And so anyway, I just I think that it's already happening. I don't think we have to wait for the day. And sure, it's not evenly distributed. Not every company is getting there. But again, you go back to that Darwinian evolution. It's not like, oh, I have to convince executives. Competitive pressures will convince executives that we need to trust developers more and more. We need to let them pick the infrastructure that allows us to move quickly and be agile and be responsive to customers. Because if they don't, their companies will lose. Those executives may not have their jobs for a long time if they're accountable for the outcome, for revenue growth, for happy customers and all that kind of stuff. So competitive pressures and then competitive uh, pressures in the employment market for how do you actually uh, hire and retain great technical talent. Those are the things that I think actually give developers their power over time. Yeah, I remember a quote from uh, Mark Andresen who said, my worst investment is not the one that I made and I, where I lost money, it's the one I didn't made and that was a success, right? And you mm -hmm. talk about that in the book, you say, look, don't be afraid of failure on the 100 project that will you will maybe fail at, at, at a small cost, at a small amount, you will maybe raise one billion or dozens of billion projects because you will have this agile methodology thinking in terms of software, in terms of APIs. So to, to conclude, what will be your message to company who don't yet ask their developers? For folks who don't uh, yet ask their developers, I think I would just say this. If you believe 
that being a great digital company is key to success in the digital economy, then you have to believe that building software is how you're going to do it. That's how you're going to compete. And if you believe that the company that builds the best software will win, then your technical talent is the key to unlocking that outcome. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And a lot of API entrepreneurs actually can be the piece of software that solve these big company problems and build a Twilio for not for communication, it's already there, and the customer engagement, but for anything else of the digital software supply chain. Exactly. That's why you're going to ask your developers because your competitive environment demands it. Yeah. Ask your developer. Thank you very much, Jeff. We ordered 100 books that we will distribute among the community. It's not enough, I know. Uh, we need to, <laughs> to do more. Thank you very much for being there. Uh, it was a pleasure and, and a long time awaited Uh, uh, interview that you uh, we wanted to do for the EPIS community. Uh, uh, yes, thank you. And again, you will be always invited to tell more in other areas at EPIS conferences. Well, thank you, Maddie, for having me. And I uh, hope it's a fantastic conference. And uh, bye, everybody. That was the perfect start. Thank you, Jeff.